Welcome to the second of our debates in our series titled What If? Radical and Inspiring Ideas for Alternative Education Futures. Now, we want the IOE to be a hub for debate on education issues, and this new event series is part of that, challenging sector leaders to bring some fresh perspectives to long-standing debates in education. And we're really pleased that the TES has come on board with the series, thanks, Ed Dorrell, uh, which, of course, is helping to broaden our reach even further. For our last debate on social mobility, we were trending on Twitter, and that was despite it being both Halloween and the Great British Bake Off final. So we did really well. And as you'll see from the TES magazine on your seats, they're running accompanying pieces in the magazine, and this time there's an article by Mary Kernett Cook. A couple of housekeeping matters. For those of you who like to tweet, you'll find the uh, Wi-Fi login instructions on your seats. And those watching via the live stream can also submit questions for the panel via the hashtag, hashtag IOE debates. We're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm sounds, please take the doors behind you, turn right, and our fire marshals will guide you out onto Bedford Way, or if necessary, down a floor so that you can exit from the back of the building. So, to the debate. Well, we're seeing a huge policy focus on skills and on vocational education and training including, of course, the new T-levels and apprenticeships. But apprenticeships are already struggling to meet take-up targets. This evening, we're asking, why has the differential status of academic and vocational education been so intractable in this country? And is there really any prospect of overcoming it? Should we even want to? And what if we were really determined to level the playing field? What would that take? And to try to find the answers to those uh, challenging questions, we have our esteemed panel. Mary Kernett Cook is chair of Kensington and Chelsea College. Prior to that, she was chief executive of UCAS from 2010 to 2017. And before that, she was at the Qualifications and Curriculum Development Agency. Mary's also held a number of senior posts in the biotechnology, food and hospitality sectors. And in 2000, was awarded an OBE for services to training in the hospitality industry as well as transforming UCAS's operations more generally, it was under Mary's auspices that UCAS branched out from operating university applications to also encompass post-16 courses from apprenticeships to A-levels. Tony Little is Chief Academic Officer at GEMS Education, a schools group educating over 250,000 students across 173 nationalities. His background is as an English and drama teacher, and he served as a head teacher for 26 years. He's also been a governor for numerous schools, both in the state and independent sectors. And aside from his extensive experience in education, our interest is in hearing from Toby, Tony on this topic because of his experience in part of the education sector less associated with vocational options, including the 13 years he spent as headmaster of Eton. Sir so Michael Wilshaw is former Chief Inspector of Schools and Head of Ofsted, a post that he held from 2012 to 2016. That followed a hugely impressive record as a head teacher, responsible for turning around failing and undersubscribed schools to make them some of the best performing in the country, including Mossbourne and St Bonaventure's Catholic School. Michael's also been Director of Education for ARC Schools and an advisor to governments internationally on school improvement. In fact, he's just come back from such a venture. He was knighted for services to education in 2000. 
And my colleague, Professor Alison Fuller, joins us this evening in her capacity as Professor of Vocational Education and Work here at the IOE. Alison brings to this debate 25 years of research and publications on vocational education, encompassing work transitions, apprenticeship, and wider vocational education and training, and widening participation in education. Alison has examined provision nationally and internationally, and has also developed widely cited guidance on delivering high-quality apprenticeships. So without further ado, we'll turn to this debate, and who better than Alison to start? Alison, over to you. Thanks, Becky, and good evening, everybody. Uh, when I asked a few friends in other walks of life about the academic vocational divide, they looked baffled. One said, there isn't one. They entail each other. Building the technological, social and physical infrastructure and creating and making the goods and services that support modern life are only enabled by the availability of people with the knowledge, skills and expertise gained through education, training and participation in a range of educational and workplace settings. Electricians, doctors, barristers, carpenters, nurses, engineers and, dare I say it, academics and other <laughs> occupations develop their expertise over time and via a mix of learning from and with others, both on and off the job. In this regard, many talk about the value of apprenticeship. It's a model of learning that transcends educational and occupational boundaries and hierarchies. All young people want to have opportunities for personal growth and career development, to have access to work they enjoy, that provides a platform for progression and enables them to fulfil their potential and establish themselves financially and socially as independent adults. It's the job of a decent society to support, resource and facilitate their aspirations, at the same time as promoting social cohesion and economic success. So what is perpetuating the divide and how does it still impinge? There's lots to say, but I'll focus on just three areas, stratification and language, quality and demand. Firstly, the divide appears in the sifting and sorting of students into streams and routes, enabling or excluding their access to the oversubscribed destinations associated with the best returns and prospects available in a segmented labour market and stratified education system. A key element in this is the incre increasing proportion of young people entering higher education. In comparison, vocational education is often viewed as the less prestigious option. This scenario is not unique to the UK, but is particularly deep-rooted here. To coin a phrase, if I had a pound for every time the otherness or secondary status of vocational is expressed through terms such as non-A-level or non-university, or in terms of the 50% that don't go to university, or where apprenticeship is presented as a consolation prize for those who don't, assumed can't, go to university, I'd be very rich indeed. The unhelpful dualistic nature of much of this discourse is captured in this quotation from the American philosopher Richard Sennett. History has drawn fault lines dividing practice and theory, technique and expression, craftsman and artist, maker and user. Modern society suffers from this historical inheritance. So how do we undermine the divide? The key to this is improving quality and demand. We know a lot from research and practice about the characteristics of high-quality vocational education, including apprenticeships. Lorna Unwin and I have developed a tool for analysing its expansive and restrictive features. The more expansive provision is characterised by a planned, structured curriculum, diverse forms of participation in the workplace and educational institutions, the availability of pedagogical expertise on and off the job, time for reflection recognition of the individual's status as both learner and worker, and through provision that's linked to the qualifications that have recognised currency for ac accessing the next level. In essence, high-quality vocational education and apprenticeship represent an integrated and hybrid offer that scaffolds learning both for occupational expertise and educational progression, not for one or the other. The outdatedness of the divide is, is recognised internationally, where we see the development of hybrid programmes that simultaneously support young people's educational and occupational development. For example, Austria has invested heavily in vocational colleges, 
offering five-year, full-time programmes for 15 to 19-year-olds that prepare and qualify young people for positions in the skilled labour market, whilst at the same time enabling them to achieve the Reiferprüfung and access to university. Similar initiatives are emerging in other countries. Dual or hybrid pathways provide a hedge against the risk of unemployment as well as options for mobility. Improving quality is important, but overcoming the divide is dependent on sufficient demand in the economy from employers who want to invest in growing a skilled workforce. Much has been said about the UK's low productivity and the precarious nature of employment for many young people and adults. For example, a recent Resolution Foundation study showed how men, and particularly women, become stuck in low-paid service sectors. Weak demand for advanced and higher-level skills across the economy and the seriously uneven distribution of good, job, good jobs across the regions act as a break on the ability of vocational education and apprenticeship and general education too to leave a social mobility. In our research, we found that apprenticeship provides a window into the health of workplaces. Where apprenticeship is done well, you tend to find there's good training and development in place for the whole workforce well-designed jobs, higher levels of employee involvement and opportunities for career progression. The quality of work is important, providing the structural and workplace pedagogical conditions to facilitate or inhibit learning. Contributing effectively in and across diverse teams requires development of what's being called relational capacity. As educators, it, cha as educators, it challenges us to think about our pedagogy recognising the shortcomings in modes of delivery based on concepts of tr trans transmission from expert to novice and identifying ways of better supporting <coughs> learners, for example, by developing project and problem-based approaches and well-designed and facilitated work placements. In a recent front-page article, The Times ran the headline, Top Schools Push Pupils Away from Universities, Privately Educated Advised to Learn Trades. So can we take this as an encouraging sign if the children of the wealthy and advantaged are going to become the tradespeople of the future? Of course, there's more to it. As we go on to read about the swift appropriation of attractive and relatively well-funded degree apprenticeships for 18-year-olds, we've already attained a mix of A-levels and level 3 BTECs. There's a real danger of new glass ceilings being imposed on those coming from below. Overcoming the divide depends not only on the quality of teaching and learning in schools, colleges, universities and workplaces, but also on the quality of work and increased availability of expansive educational and employment opportunities. John Dewey argued for a concept of vocational education that recognises the intrinsic values associated with holistic learning for occupational expertise and practice for the individual and for wider society. Lorna Unwin has suggested that this broader understanding of vocational education should be reflected in all education. It won't be easy or cheap, but if we achieve this, we would be well on the way of overcoming the academic vocational divide. Thank you, Alison. <clears throat> Michael. Thanks, Becky, and uh, good evening, everyone. If the... Uh if the introduction of the apprenticeship levy and the recent publication of an industrial strategy means that at long last we've woken up to the shambles that passes for, passes for vocational education in this country, then we should all give two cheers or maybe one. So why have the policymakers woken up from their uh, torpor? Perhaps it's the 200,000 unfilled vacancies in shortage skills areas and the fear of this getting significantly worse after Brexit. Perhaps it's the continuing concerns about our failure to tackle low, low productivity, which is one of the worst in Europe. Whatever it is, we should try and be cautiously optimistic and not before time. The lack of political focus for over half a century has meant that half our future, as Newsom said about another big uh, divide in, in our society when, we, when we, he was looking at grammar schools, has been neglected for half a century. It's meant that too many of those youngsters who can't or don't want to proceed to A-levels or university have been failed for far too long. It's meant that every initiative 
from CPV, you can see how old I am when I mention something called CPV. None, none, nobody in this room, room remembers it. It's meant that every initiative from CPV to TVEI to diplomas to GMVQs to NVQs have foundered because they were taken by other people's children in places that politicians know very little about and rarely send their own children to. Hardly surprising, then, that we have an underfunded FE system, which, let me remind you, educates 100,000 young people every year. More 16-year-olds go to FE institutions than to sixth form colleges and sixth forms in schools. It's hardly surprising that 40% of colleges in the last inspection year of my tenure as HMCI were judged less than good. It's hardly surprising that two-thirds of youngsters who didn't achieve the benchmark GCSE grades at English and Maths at 16 didn't achieve those grades two years later. And it's no good the FE sector complaining about that. They should damn well get, get off their backsides and work harder to get them those GCSEs. In two of the f biggest FE colleges, it's hardly surprising that in two of the biggest FE colleges in the West Midlands, less than 10% of the courses were devoted to apprenticeships. That's in the West Midlands, in the black country, the heart of the old Industrial Revolution. Hardly surprising that the largest institutions in our country, the most autonomous and the most unscrutinized institutions in our education system, are not subject to LEA or RSC oversight, are the most underperforming. More interested in the completion of courses than their relevance to local and national employment needs. Hardly surprising that nearly half of apprenticeships, particularly intermediate apprenticeships in the service and business sectors, were judged to be less than good because they were too low level or simply accredited existing work by Ofsted. But, 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 if this new awakening isn't just going to be another false dawn, then a number of things have to happen in my view. Firstly, political focus has to be more intense more continuous and at a much higher level. A junior minister in the DfE with a responsibility for skills who may or may not stay very long will simply no longer be acceptable. A heavyweight politician, a deputy prime minister perhaps, needs to take ownership of what is going to be a huge issue in post-Brexit Britain and sit across the departments of education, business and employment as well as the CBI and the Chambers of Commerce to ensure all stakeholders work effectively, especially small businesses where most apprentices are employed and where most of the difficulties arise in relation to the training, finance and the administration of apprenticeships. Without this strong political drive, momentum will be lost and the silos we now see recreated. Education needs to talk to business on the curriculum and vice versa. The Department of Employment needs to talk to both, to both on job vacancies and skill shortage areas. The CBI needs to work with local employers on the accreditation and training of apprentices. I don't need to labour the point. Secondly, the, the secondary curriculum has to be given the flexibility to accommodate a strong core as well as those subjects and areas of the curriculum that young people need for employment in the 21st century. The study of history and geography should not be at the expense of sufficient time being given to design, robotics, computer science and technology. I despair at the number of schools I've been into recently where technology workshops and engineering studios have been stripped out because those curriculum areas have been downgraded. For goodness sake, the EBAC has its place. But the idea that every student should do it, as was suggested by the Department of Education not so long ago, is quite clearly bonkers. Thirdly, get Ofsted to shine a much more intense spotlight on careers education in secondary schools to improve the dire state of vocational guidance, particularly for those students looking for apprenticeships. Indeed, the government should urgently introduce a UCAS system for apprenticeships to make the whole process of application much clearer and much simpler for students thinking of pursuing uh, apprenticeships after they leave school. Fourthly, do something urgently about the growing disparity in performance in secondary schools in the north of England and the south. 
What's happening at the moment is completely unacceptable and is creating a huge inequality in provision across the country. Unless youngsters leave school literate and numerate, they will not go into apprenticeships. And it's simply not fair what's happening in secondary schools in the north to deny those youngsters that opportunity. And lastly, don't abandon the UTC initiative to inject more competition into the FE space. But make sure that UTCs are lodged firmly into, the, into successful multi-academy trusts to ensure that there is effective oversight and intervention, which there isn't now with standalone UTCs. I know this is a bit of a shopping list, but the most important is the first on my list, the political will and the determination to see these initiatives through and achieve, if it is at all possible, a cross-party consensus on the way forward for skills over the next few years. Michael, thank you. Good, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about secondary education. Um, I don't really think that secondary education's primary purpose is to produce uh, oven-ready workers. Uh, there's plenty of time for young people to figure out uh, how to get on in work for the next four or five decades. Um, uh, however, I do think vocational education has a, a place in post-16 education. Three things I'm going to mention uh, if we really want to overcome the academic vocational divide. Uh, careers education, assessment, uh, and literacy and numeracy. So on careers education, I say education advisedly. I definitely don't mean uh, careers information, advice, and guidance. Uh, we're generally asking young people to follow broadly uh, an academic curriculum up to the age of 16, at which point most kids will either do uh, pretty well or have similar performance across STEM and non-STEM subjects, or they'll fall more definitely into one or the other. Um, so uh, a few careers fairs, some talks from well-meaning employers. I, I just don't think those equip students to make choices about their future careers at the grand old age of 16. Uh, usually, actually, the advice bit uh, is not about careers at all. It's about what uh, qualifications uh, the student should follow in key stage five, and very often just driven by prior attainment. Uh, when I say careers education, uh, I mean education. I mean actually teaching young people about different sectors, what happens in different sectors, what different types of jobs there are, the difference between uh, the private sector and the public sector, uh, manufacturing and service sectors, what exactly is an entrepreneur, what's the difference between uh, being a small cog uh, in a big wheel or a big cog in a small wheel, high autonomy, low autonomy jobs and so on. And by the way, also the risks and sacrifices uh, that come with high paid, high responsibility jobs. I think young people need to understand also that careers have two components, the role uh, that you undertake, but also the sector that you undertake it in. So uh, uh, all those aspiring lawyers, there still seem to be uh, hundreds of thousands of them, need to know that they might end up uh, in corporate law or criminal law. They might end up uh, working in, as lawyers in the pharmaceutical sector or in a charity. And the post-16 uh, skills plan has 15 pathways, and they include things like transport and logistics, or engineering and manufacturing. And, and I ask you, what 16-year-old uh, knows anything meaningful about what those choices might mean? And I think we do need to equip them with the knowledge to make those choices. Secondly, assessment. Uh, now, the vocabulary of academic study, exams, syllabus, levels, subjects that are studied, I think they, uh, that sits awkwardly in a vocational learning context. Um, but in an attempt to create equivalence or parity of esteem, we've tried over uh, generations to use the academic assessment model uh, for vocational learning and then wondered uh, why on earth it doesn't produce job-ready students. Even uh, BTECs or other applied general qualifications are apparently about to be reclassified as academic qualifications because uh, it seems they don't really fit anywhere else. <clears throat> And as in other areas of education, policymakers seem always to turn to qualifications reform when they want to achieve improvements in vocational education and training. 
Um, at least with academic subjects, the curriculum is relatively stable and the long lead time it takes to develop qualifications isn't too much of a problem. But in uh, vocational areas, the environment's changing all the time uh, and at a pace which I think is incompatible with the usual slow beat rhythms of qualification development. We live uh, in an era of almost frightening pace in technology change, which is affecting almost every occupation on the planet. So why do we rely on qualifications that can never keep up uh, to underpin vocational education? We need to get away from a curriculum led by qualifications and get back uh, to, uh, sorry, the other way around, qualifications leading curriculum and get back to uh, curriculum leading qualifications. Um, my third and final point is about literacy and numeracy. Um, I think that continuing to create, regulate and fund vocational qualifications that can be achieved without appropriate levels of literacy and numeracy will never support a technically qualified workforce that can progress to higher levels uh, which the economy so badly needs. Many vocational qualifications are seen as below par because they can be achieved without the matching levels of literacy and numeracy that are necessary to undertake uh, even relatively low-skilled roles, let alone the more exacting uh, complex or technical jobs. <clears throat> so the critical ingredient to bridging the academic vocational divide is the develop development of new approaches to literacy and numeracy. I think what's needed is a contemporary and work-related curriculum with a context for learning that both motivates and engages students in developing their numeracy and literacy. Uh, vocational qualifications will never achieve status if they don't develop at the same time articulacy, literacy, uh, quantitative literacy, technical fluency and cognitive agility at appropriate levels. Uh, if they are successful... T-levels uh, should be an attractive alternative to A-levels. I think that's where they've been uh, positioned and, and possibly um, also an alternative to other level three study programs such as BTEX. Um, but to do so, I think they'll need to be radically different in their approach. Transferring level three learners from one qualification program to another will not increase national skills levels overall. Arguably, fixing vocational education at level three through T levels before addressing deficits at level two is a bit like asking someone to scale a ladder with uh, a few of the lower rungs missing. Um, as, a, as a minimum, careers education needs to fix that. Uh, so I'll finish by asking what is being done for the 250,000 uh, 16 year olds uh, who need to get back on track after failing to secure GCSE English and maths and I don't agree with Michael that they should just be sat down uh, to do the same thing again uh, finding a vocational context to improve literacy and numeracy for post 16 I think is the most urgent task for bridging the academic, academic vocational divide thank you Very thank you <laughs> and Tony Thank you. Good evening, everyone. You've already heard a great deal from my fellow panellists. Alison elegantly gave us the context and reminded us what a true holistic education should look like. Michael laid a glove on the DfE, but then celebrated the fact that politicians appear to be waking up. And Mary gave us a considered critique of secondary education, and I could not endorse more heartily her view that curriculum should lead qualification, not the other way around as it is at present. But I want to come at this from a slightly different angle, partly perhaps because I have spent a large chunk of my working life being ahead of what would be described as academic schools. I have spent some time over the last couple of weeks talking with employers, people who have invested time and money in apprentices. Not big companies, but small companies. And these are people who are passionate. It was summed up for me in a conversation I had yesterday with a man who was just about to retire following 40 years working in his business for whom apprenticeships and vocational training were a key strut of the way the business could operate. 
And he was unremittingly scathing about what has happened over the past 40 years. And it really seemed to boil down to two things. First of all, the flip-flopping nature of the way approvals of programmes has been considered. It's gone from being, in his view, over-prescriptive and demanding irrelevant courses of study for students. So neither the would-be employer nor the student has been satisfied. And then it's veered to a kind of open season, which has led to, in his view, Mickey Mouse courses being made available and selling students short. And the second issue is around funding. And in his view, unless there is robust quality assurance of properly accredited programmes and serious tax relief for employers who choose to invest in apprenticeships, then, as it were, working backwards, the whole of the vocational programme potters and falls. It isn't actually producing what the country needs and what companies need. So the whole thing is unremittingly awful. But then you look back at what politicians have said. I I looked up earlier today because I had a dim memory of it. Matt Hancock's speech in 2014 when he was at the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, almost copybook stuff. There's a rather fine analysis of what's been wrong and what we should do right. Go further back to 2008, the Labour government proposals for a mixed economy post-16. It's pretty impressive reading. So somehow collectively we've managed to identify the problem and pretty much agreed it's a mess and successive generations have made the mess even worse. So why? Why? Well, it seems to me two things, doubtless many more, but two things occur to me. The first is that we have never properly explained the benefits of vocational courses to all students. I am struck by the evidence that now exists that students who have taken some degree of vocational course in the latter years of secondary school are better prepared for the challenges of university life, tending to be more flexible, more able to deal with information in different ways, even better with deadlines. Given the changing world, which is, we're about to move from a period, I suspect, of linear change into a kind of exponential change where all bets are off and the world would look vastly different, that a multiplicity of learning styles should be encouraged for all our students. Back to what Alison quoted from Dewey, the true nature of an holistic education. Let me take time out in a parenthesis and say, here am I, having spent years talking about the benefits of holistic education in a broadly academic school, having nothing to do with vocational courses. So, you know, I'm a hypocrite, but it goes with the territory. I'll come back to that point as to why I didn't. So explaining the benefits could be done better, more fully, and with greater purpose. But there is something else as well, and that's to do with an innate snobbery that exists within the world of education. Over the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time travelling around the world, and if the, the divide between the vocational and the academic is marked here, which it is, it's like that in spades in some other parts of the world. And I've recently come back from a Southeast Asian country where it seems to me there are three palpable assumptions operating which make the two worlds completely separate. The first is the idea that there is a separate distinction to be made between the academic and the vocational. In other words, as a student, you fall into one camp or the other. They're quite discrete groups. The second is that high-performing students in schools must be academically inclined. Seems a little odd, but it's quite clearly, it's palpable, palpably there in that culture. And the third is that Almost by definition, the hands-on vocational students, pretty much by definition, must be in academic terms rather dim. And it's deeply rooted in that culture in a way that, even in the UK, might seem trenchant and faintly absurd. But actually, the backwash is with us, and I speak to many, many parents, and have done over the years. And in one shape or form, that's pretty much what they feel. So, what's to be done? What's to be done? I'm leaping over the detail to the bottom line. But in my view, things won't change until it is an obligation on all schools and all students post-16 to take at least one vocational course, whoever they are, whatever their aspirations may be. And there's a very strong argument that, for example, a highly academic student taking double maths and physics with a view to becoming an engineer at a top university would benefit hugely from taking a vocational course in engineering or problem solving or design. I've tried to explain that to parents, and I failed. They don't read it. So why didn't I? Why was I not less of a hypocrite? Why didn't I simply change the system in the schools of which I was head? Partly because it was an uphill struggle with entrenched parental perceptions. But in truth, more importantly, 
because I feared for the university admissions chances of students who weren't presenting themselves with what was perceived to be a top-line academic credential. They'd be too easy to pick off the pass at the pass and to reject. So hand in glove with my suggestion that all students in all our schools post-16 should take at least one vocational course must come with the re-education of our university admissions tutors and making it incumbent on them that they must take these qualifications in the round and as a balanced package. There we are, solved with a stroke. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Or not. Well, thank you so much, colleagues, for those brilliant inputs. It's fascinating to me. Um, first of all, um, to hear the uh, broad consensus, actually, at the need to challenge the divide. We haven't really had much about the should we want to challenge that divide at all. And with particular people in the audience, I'm noticing... Uh, Michael Young at the back there. Uh, we may get into that debate a little bit more when we open up for questions. Um, secondly, it seems to me that um, there's a challenge, isn't there, that's coming through some of the uh, contributions about this um, potential conflation, but there's agreement that uh, we shouldn't be thinking about vocational qualifications as being for those that can't, right go on to a levels and universities and so on and yet we keep coming back don't we to the to the forgotten 50 percent uh those that struggle with literacy and numeracy and so on and so forth so i wonder whether um the persistent sort of division and potential denigration of vocational um is due to its falling victim of the what do we do with these kids question um uh, and, and the um challenge to facilitate routes which interestingly we don't talk about very much about routes into a level in the same way um so that's just um a couple of impressions for me um, perhaps I could just turn um, to colleagues if anybody wants to input on this question um, about this conflation for those that can't. Do we think that that's a challenge or not? Who can't? Kids. We're talking about kids. Yeah. But who can't? Why can't they? Well, we're to, what I'm trying to argue is we seem to have a conflation between a view of the kind of this is what the economy needs, Rolls Royce. Um, you know, young designers, people looking at artificial intelligence and so on at a sort of level three uh, vocational route. Thing to or, say. or how are we facilitating kids that actually haven't even got level two in terms of literacy and numeracy? So it, that my, my worry is that actually um, we, th this has been a struggle for UTCs, hasn't it? They were originally envisaged as these amazing um, hubs of technical brilliance and so on, but in practice often have been seen as problematic for parents and um, struggling to fill their roles because of this public perception. So this is the challenge, is it, is it, is it not? Well, well it's, it's, it's a classic argument of a failing head in a failing school. These kids can't. Down the road, a mile down the road, you find another head of a very successful school with the same sort of intake saying we can. And, so and, why, and, don't, and, we, why don't we say they should get into A levels? That's my point. Well, they can do an equivalent A level course in a vocational subject. I'm not against that. I'm simply against the patronising attitudes that we have towards these guys to say they can't do it. it as, as a, I won't be popular with the FE sector again, but you know, the fact that the, you know, what, to, over two thirds of youngsters who don't get... And they would, may have just failed their GCSEs. Don't get their, that minimum qualification two years later. And there will be people flocking to the, 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 the cause of the FE sector saying, well, it's just too difficult, they've lost interest, and all the rest of it. That's a nonsense. I was only trying to characterise the debate, by the way. But uh, <laughs> colleagues on this side, what do you think? Um... Well, I'll just, uh, I'll just pick up a, a bit of that and a bit of what um, Tony was saying because um, you know, I watched while I was uh, at the Mission Control UCAS um, for seven years, um, I watched as, as universities um, changed to actually start accepting uh, students with BTECs and similar um, vocational qualifications because there the simply weren't enough uh, human beings with A-levels going around with the, with the population falling and so on. 
Um, and uh, most of, uh, actually 25% of the undergraduate intake now is going with BTECs and similar qualifications, either mixed with A-levels or on their own. Um, I was at uh, Nottingham Trent University, highly respected former polytechnic, which is heavily in the kind of middle tariff sector. They have nearly 40% of their intake uh, with BTECs. Nevertheless, the university sector has had to change how it supports students coming in with BTECs because they don't come with the re requisite uh, literacy and numeracy and therefore the study skills that allow them to successfully access higher education. I think, um, Tony, the universities would welcome with open arms students that um, came with vocational qualifications if they were a proper preparation for, for higher education. So you're absolutely right. There wasn't probably anything that you could have given your students at Eton in the, in the kind of vocational realm that, uh, that would have been acceptable, to, uh, particularly to the high, you know, the Russell groups and, and so on. Um, so, you know, BTECs in, and uh, other level three vocational qualifications, in my view, are not level three. They're level two and a half. And that's why they've become the sort of pathway for the, for the young people who haven't got such strong GCSEs. The strong ones go into the A-level set and the less strong ones go into the BTEC set because it is easier to succeed on a BTEC route if you haven't got that underpinning literacy and numeracy. I'm sorry to put it in such stark terms, but I've seen it over and over and over well, again. Well, Mary, I wouldn't disagree. I think you're right, but you're talking about an aspect of the problem that we can fix, and that's making the vocational Absolutely. qualifications of a suitable standard. Absolutely. It goes back to my employer, the chap I was talking to yesterday, decrying the fact that there is not robust quality assurance of vocational courses at the moment. Absolutely. He sees it at the sharp end running a business, and it's certainly as sure as eggs is eggs. If you were in a university admissions tutor, you'd feel it in the same way. But we can get that right. It, uh, in terms of how one, whether it's bottom down, uh, bottom up or top down, that's a matter for debate. But it'd be interesting to speculate that if Oxbridge insisted on a vocational course for any student whom they were going to ex uh, accept. I suspect that would have a seismic effect in sh very short order in the whole landscape of vocational training. Thank you. Alison, did you have a... Just, just a couple of things. I think I, somebody said that the best vocational qualification you can have is GCSE, English and Maths. Um, so essentially to provide that platform then for, for, for going on. Um, and it is shocking when you, you read that it's still uh, only 50-odd percent of the cohort that achieve five GCSEs, including English and maths. So that, you know, clearly is a, is a huge problem, which is perhaps for another debate about, about, um, about why that is and, and what can be done. But about qualifications, really, um, what I'm struck about, uh, struck with um, relating to some of the newest um, initiatives, and, uh, you know, we, we never have any shortage of initiatives in this space, is that with both the new um, trailblazer apprenticeship standards and the T-levels, there's a retreat from qualifications. So not having qualifications which give a clear line of sight to the next level or to a destination seems to be okay for those that are in a work-based or a vocational route. Where it would be a hor people would be horrified if that was applied to the other routes. So I think that's something that really does need to look at. Young people really do need to know what currency is going to be available at the end of the, the, the options that they're um, participating in. Perhaps that goes back to guidance. But I think it's, it, it's a real concern. And just on the T-levels, whilst there's a lot of rhetoric a moment, at the moment talking, talking up T-levels, particularly as level three uh, routes, given that point that I made about the, 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 the lack of enough people with level two then essentially uh, the majority of people that aren't uh, um, able to access the T-level will be in what's called the transition year. And we hear very little about what that's going to look like and what kind of quality is going to be available uh, to young people. In fact, you know, probably well over 100,000 young people in that position. Okay, well, let's open up for questions and we'll take a couple at a time. Um, so a colleague over here. Do we have a, a microphone? It's, it's, it's on its way. Uh, 
make about every qualification having um, numeracy and literacy elements, is it really beyond the wit of man or woman to create a, a curriculum that actually is hybrid in the sense that actually it is able to do both of those things? Um, I ha have a reason for saying this. I've just come from an IB career-related program conference uh, this afternoon where there were 70 schools gathered where they're saying that it's a course which is enabling students who previously could not access A-levels to get to university and also enabling those students both to be able to go to university and also choose between that and taking up apprenticeships. And what that is is a hybrid course with the academic and the vocational bound together in a coherent course. Is that really beyond us? Very much. We'll take another couple of questions if we can. Michael. Um, um, first, I wanted to say how pleased I was to hear what Mary said that in fact we yet again are about to make the sixth or seventh mistake by actually thinking that we could reform education through qualifications. And we're going, and this is T levels. I mean, I. I was involved in the early days of MVQ, and that's a long time ago, and probably you were. We have to actually not. We have to actually start with what we want the education to do, not with the outcomes that you've measured. And I, I just despair that we go through yet another qualification reform. Uh, the, the, um, and I think I think that's re really important. The other thing I want to say is we haven't really yet heard anything in relation to the question whether we might not actually want the academic vocation divide and what we were going to do about that. Uh, what we've assumed, and I think it's really questionable, that somehow or other it's actually rooted in the education system. But actually it's rooted in the division of labour, the nature of the work we have. It has its origins in industrialisation. It's continuing now despite the kind of progressive end or a new form of industrialization. And unless we actually seriously tackle not the kind of superficial thing that we see in the industrial strategy uh, that came out ye the day before yesterday, but actually seriously tackle the nature of work in the society, then in a sense we might as well stop this conversation because in a sense that's where, that's where the division comes from. And I just would like everyone on the panel to make some comment in relation to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we've got one more over here, and one we'll take them in the round. And come on, women, I want some women next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I welcome two things? Um, first of all, the suggestion that we should have the political will to move forward. And secondly, this very radical uh, proposal that, in fact, curriculum should lead assessment. I think, that, I think the two are tied together, actually, very beautifully. If you look at uh, the history of the 80s, we saw quite a lot of very interesting curriculum-led development in terms, of the, in terms of the TVI. We saw it completely wiped out by the national curriculum. Essentially, there... In a, there, in a nutshell, you see the nature, the nature of the problem. And unless we get back to um, academics really being involved in the curriculum and professionals in schools being involved in the curriculum and industry being involved in the curriculum, we're not going to move forward. I do very much agree with what Michael was saying, that... Uh, simply a reform of certain examinations is not going to take, us, uh, to take us forward. Thank you very much. So I think we've got one point of support. Um, we've got this point about um, curriculum leading assessment, but Michael Young's challenge back that um, it looks as though actually uh, qualifications are leading curriculum again instead. And we've got questions about a hybrid curriculum and we've got questions about qualification reform and the nature of work. Um, who would like to, should we just start with Tony and work? Can you manage? Or move okay. there you go. Thank you, Mary. John's notion about a hybrid course sounds a good thing. And just to emphasize one aspect of that, when I was talking about all students having 
mandatorily having some vocational aspect of their post-16 course. This isn't a flaccid attempt at social engineering. It's genuinely because I believe they'd be better students and better scholars as a consequence of doing this. So that is certainly an avenue worth pursuing. In response to Michael's point, I touched on it very briefly when I alluded to a dramatically changing workplace for our young people and it's going to happen in very short order now one of two things is going to happen either we are collectively going to embrace a curriculum which is going to be flexible and encourage our young people to be confident about a world that's going to me be very uncomfortable or we're going to go along as we are realize there's a hideous shortage of skills in t 5, 10, 20 years' time, and then scrabble about trying to sort it out. And my, mother's on, my money is on the latter, so I still live in hope for the former. You are right in the sense that we are, we're rehearsing, we're preparing our army for the last war. We're rehearsing for a set of opportunities that are going to look completely different from those which we anticipate right now. Um, so uh, I just uh, just to, to reflect, uh, I I left school at um, at 16 um, and started work pretty much straight away. I didn't go to university until I was in my 40s, um, and uh, I, I really minded not being a graduate. Um, but most of all, uh, I minded feeling what I still feel about myself as not being educated. I know I'm quite smart. I ended up being quite good at work and being able to learn how to do the stuff that you need to do at work, at work. So I just kind of have a little bit of caution about, um, uh, you know, sort of factory farming youngsters into doing work training uh, when, they're, when they're still very young. Having, having said that, um, uh, I completely agree that actually... Starting with the curriculum, what do pe people need to uh, learn and therefore be taught and then figuring out how to assess it. Um, I do think that the IB is probably the only, the International Baccalaureate is probably the only programme that is genuinely uh, curriculum led in the way that the assessment works. And I, and I am interested, um, John mentioned earlier the um, International Baccalaureate careers related programme, which I think is still quite in its infancy um, but I'm watching it very carefully because it does um, a little bit of what uh, Tony was suggesting. It combines um, A-levels or B-techs or, or, or um, not A-levels, um, IB, higher level and standard level um, academic subjects potentially with B-techs, but then also has the core um, and the kind of skills-related uh, learning so that young people do come out with the literacy and numeracy in their chosen subjects to support their skills learning, which I think... Um, is uh, very important indeed. Um, uh, it's, it has to be about outcomes. I, I worry about asking employers to get involved in designing qualifications. Um, those, uh, an earlier speaker was talking about the number of initiatives. Uh, you know, I was last involved in the, uh, the ill-fated diploma program, which was kind of Tomlinson light, and we had masses of employers all doing actually some really interesting work. But employers at the moment are being asked to contribute to um, developing the new apprenticeship standards. And then suddenly we're going to ask them all to kind of gather around and also create uh, the curriculum for, uh, and the syllabus for T-levels. And, you know, I'm just I'm not convinced that that is the best way to do it. And I think we need more input um, from academics in some of these areas uh, to help uh, develop the curriculum. Thank you. Well, I've heard that phrase, curriculum-led assessment, for so long I, I get bored with it. What does it mean, curriculum-led assessment? I mean, if you're an employer, you want to know how well these youngsters have done in their examinations. What are their outcomes like? How do they, are, they literate, are they numerate in relation to the grades that they've achieved at GCSE, at A-level, or BTEC, or whatever? You know, the curriculum is there for all youngsters to acquire a body of knowledge. And that knowledge has to be tested and assessed. And employers want to know what, how well it's been tested and assessed. So I'm not sure what the argument is about curriculum-led assessment. I'm not about sure. Exam what it, factories. Well, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> employers want to know how, you know, whether the youngsters they're going to take on and pay and employ are literate and numerate and have the relevant qualifications that, that will be required in the, in the workplace. 
And, you know, we make, we're apologists for a failing system if we don't recognise that. We're all in this room saying it's not very good, our, our vocational system in this country. Uh, the divide is far too great. We're, we're languishing in relation to other, uh, other countries. As a result, productivity is low. And yet we're sitting in this room being apologists for, the, for maintaining what has failed miserably for the last half century. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Alison, come on in. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll go back to the hybrid point. Um, I was involved in a cross-European study of um, hybrid routes um, a couple of years ago um, where we looked at um, the emergent, their emergence in Switzerland, Austria, Denmark, um, and to some extent in, in England. One thing that really struck me was that, yes, they are possible, and we saw some fantastic uh, practice, fantastic curricula and forms of assessment. But um, what was common was that the courses were longer than the equivalent single route, usually by at least a year, and the intensity double was double our intensity. So full time in these countries equals about 30 hours a week of uh, contact time and input, um, and it's the equivalent here is around about 15. So, you know, it's, it's going, yes, it's possible, but it's a longer be more intense and see a lot more expensive. And that's really been an Achilles heel um, in this country is the willingness, going back to political will, to recognise that doing this well costs a lot of money and actually costs more than A-levels. Mm. Um, so nice. that's, that's really important, nice. I think. And, and the other point that I just wanted to make about the curriculum, the, some of the best curriculum-led assessment that I've seen has actually been in workplaces where they know how to do apprenticeship properly, you actually see curriculum in action. You, you really do see a planned curriculum and you see assessment following that. But of course, that's in the workplace, in the context of the work uh, and so on. And if the work is of good quality, that provides a really good resource for it. But young people also, I think, do need qualifications. And to deny them to a certain proportion of young people and not to others, and to deny them to those young people who are already disadvantaged in this kind of competi the competitive scenario that we have uh, seems to me to be misguided uh, uh, beyond the extreme. Thank you. Excellent. OK, more questions. Oh, good. So we've got a clutch here, uh, starting with the lady in the blue top. And... Uh, there's a little triangle of questioners. And could you uh, maybe say who you are to start with? And... Um, my name is Joan Grant. Um, I haven't really got a question. It's actually more of a comment. And the comment is that education these days has become a sort of um, Ponzi scheme. And it seems to be just about getting people into university and then having them pay fees that they're not going to pay back. And I think that... Um, Something needs to be done, I don't know what, about actually having a, a proper pathway for young people who are not academic, where they can get meaningful qualifications, actually go into work and earn a living, and there isn't this pressure to go to university unnecessarily. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Helen Scott and I'm a head of chemistry in a secondary school um, and I was really interested about the point about different approaches to literacy, uh, in particular the idea of quantitative literacy. So as a scientist I obviously appreciate that massively and the um, importance of literacy and numeracy for science and also for a lot of the skill jobs that we're talking about um, the need for in our economy and I was just interested about, I've just finished a master's in digital technology and education and particularly in the role of uh, the skill of evaluating information and sources of information uh, in such a knowledge-rich uh, uh, kind of internet age, so to speak. And I just wondered what your opinion was on uh, hybrid integration of stuff like in, uh, information literacy into the curriculum and assessment versus having it as its own standalone qualification, um, because I'm not sure what my opinion is. So, thanks. Thank you very much. And... Um... Ed from the, T, from the T, yes. Uh, very short question. Does anyone on the panel think T levels will work? <laughs> so, are there particular points that colleagues would like to answer? Alison, let's start with you this time. Well, um, well, we thought at one point that the diplomas were doomed to succeed, and um, I don't know whether that's going to be the case for T-levels or not. What we, we know is that um, for a, a really good quality uh, programme to work, you have to have a lot of involvement from employers offering work placements um, that are significant and that are going to, um, to, to gen really generate um, some motivation and, uh, and the development of, of, of skills and so on. Um, I'm 
I must say I do feel sceptical because I don't really know, I don't really think it's been thought through what they're for, particularly given that the BTECs are still going to be available for the full-time route. So is that, you know, a kind of indicator of just um, tiering? You know, there's A-levels, BTECs, T-levels, apprenticeship. You know, it's, it's really not clear. And given that we know that, that the, the majority of those kind of slotted or slated for T-levels aren't going to be doing T-levels, they'll be doing the transition. So um, very concerning. Also concerning about the um, availability of uh, enough well-resourced, well-paid and well-trained vocational teachers uh, to, to, to offer those T levels and really, really lead them. So, uh, yeah, I, I think if I was a betting woman, I might say no. Okay. If, it, I mean, if T levels are taught well, led well, uh, have credibility with employers, um, then it will work. If, if, if that doesn't happen, then it won't work. Mary. Um, yes, I was just uh, going to pick up the comment about, um, you know, this obsession with getting uh, young people into university. And, and you, you'll never hear me um, talk down going to university because I uh, have met over the years many thousands of students whose lives have been transformed. But I do also accept um, that it's not for everyone. The trouble is at the moment... Uh, there isn't a credible alternative to university. For people who've got good level three qualifications, there's not really anywhere else uh, for them to go. And if we fix this, I think we can get to a stage where it becomes as cool, if not cooler, not to go to uni than it does uh, to go. Um, I've spoken to <clears throat> a number of young people who are doing uh, degree apprenticeships um, and you can absolutely see the appeal there. Earn while you learn. Uh, they're going off into jobs that they're highly motivated to do. And guess what? You know, there they are at Jaguar Land Rover and they come out with a degree from uh, Warwick University as well. But we do have to be careful about that because um, if you do a degree apprenticeship, you're looking at going into a job and staying in it for four, five or six years now, I know lots of young people at 16, 17 or 18 who just haven't got that absolute sureness about what they want to do and what job they want to do. Most don't even have it at the end of uni. So I think, I think we have to be quite careful. I think if we, get, if we can get really good um, technical and vocational skills development, let's call it, roots whether they have qualifications um, attached or what kind of assessment is, is another issue. Um, but there has to be a credible alternative to going to, to university for people who uh, don't want to take that route. Thank you, Mary. Just pick up on one point, and it was the comment about literacy and numeracy, and it's recurred this evening. I understand the point that vocational courses are seen to be light on literacy and numeracy, but it seems odd, really most odd. It's as though we're somehow generating an either-or culture rather than a both-and. It seems to me that literacy and numeracy fundamentally should be a part of the cornerstone, the fabric of any vocational course. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Mary, were we wrong to get rid of pollies? Oh, um, I, do you know, I don't even really care um uh i've uh, i've almost forgotten which of the former pollies i you know i think the sneering about them is completely out of place i think it's fantastic that having more universities that take in a wider diversity of uh of students with different qualifications uh is nothing other than a really good thing um now, do we, do we need something other than universities, uh, you know, technical colleges or something? Uh, I think we have them. They're called further education colleges. Um, the trouble is that they've never been funded properly. Um, and, and they, you know, I'm, a, I'm chair of governors at Kensington and Chelsea College. And, you know, the, with, with all the other difficulties, not having enough money to do what they do really, really well and having a very, very limited curriculum available uh, for, for post-16 um, education uh, is, you know, it continues to be a real problem. Do, you know, but do we need another type of 
organisation, institution. I don't, I don't think we really do. Um, we've got a couple of um, Twitter questions coming in from the uh, live feed. Um, we've got a question from Azuma Carroll. Um, who's quoting uh, this notion of this the sort of stereotype of vocational education being intended for this uh, group of the students that can't. Um, and she's asking, how do we break this perception? So that's one question. And a question from David Harborn. What does the panel think about the balanced Key Stage 4 curriculum in... Oh, Northern Ireland, where all students, including grammars, take both technical and vocational qualifications. Any comments? Michael, you're looking cross. No, I'm not cross. I'm not cross. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm entirely supportive of a balanced curriculum, a balance between pure academic courses and vocational courses. And in fact, you know, you're a science teacher, aren't you? Are you head of science? Yeah, but you will know you will know that the science you will know that the science curriculum is vastly different now than it was a few years ago, with plenty of uh, practical applications. Same in maths uh, as well. So the curriculum has moved much more towards practical applications in those in those in those subjects. Um, so um, yes, I, I'm fully supportive of, of a balanced curriculum, a balance between pure academic courses and vocational courses. It's whether in fact, they're going to be taught well, they have sufficient rigour, and sufficient numbers of youngsters pass them. That's the problem at the moment. We've just, you know, we've recounted the figures time and again this evening of how many youngsters do well in school and how many don't. And it's, it comes back to that argument, doesn't it, of the, of the head teacher says, these youngsters can't. They can't. With a, with a head teacher further down the road, he says, yes, they can. We need that mindset in the vocational sphere, and we haven't had it for so long. And it's, it would be bad for us this evening to continue to make excuses for those people in the FE sector who constantly make excuses for poor performance. And I think they, the poor performance is, is, um, is partly because they're not sufficiently monitored. We inspect FE institutions once every three, four, five years, depending on, on their previous judgment. But who monitors what happens between inspections? <coughs> who monitors between inspections in the way that schools are supposed to be monitored by lo either local authorities or by uh, these new regional schools commissioners? You know, no wonder. They're, they're more, they are more autonomous than any other part of the education system. And we really don't know whether a large institution educating 20,000, 30,000 people is failing or not between one inspection and another. And that has to change. Thank you. We've got um, probably time for just a couple more questions if they're short and pithy. So, colleague in the middle, thank you. It's just to me that um, there may be a connection between the uh, fact that we don't have very large nationalised industries anymore because nearly all of them did a huge amount of this kind of work in a very sort of static and stable culture, which enabled uh, um, development and innovation to take place. What we have at the moment is, some, is a situation where all the different organisations who might be taking apprenticeships or supporting vocational education in general terms are all different, competing, uh, many of them are badly underfunded, etc., etc., etc. I just put that as a suggestion. Thank you very much. And we had a question here. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, is there a place-based element to some of the challenges here? So it's, it's very different to create apprenticeships and vocational training where there is um, significant um, employer input potential um, and the labour market is strong and quite another in somewhere like Hartlepool or a rural and coastal area and um, where the labour market is much weaker and there are just fewer opportunities. And in those circumstances, I think it's quite difficult then to expect schools to suggest to pupils that they pursue vocational training when the progression for them in that labour market is incredibly weak. Thank you. And we had a final... I'm sorry, Alison, I spotted another one first. So final question in the corner, um, and then we'll have a quick round of answers. Mm. 
might less abstract, more vocational courses with a strong focus on applied numeracy and literacy give an idea of the benefits and uses of numeracy and literacy, which might be more motivating for some people? Okay, thank you. Well, that's a good group of diverse questions. Um, so we've got the uh, geographic issue. Um, we've got something, again, about literacy and numeracy. Um, and again, this question about um, sheep and goats, as well as uh, the point about geographic location tying in with the point that's being made about the relevance of um, employers and local industry, I think. So, comments in? Um, so, I'm just going to pick up, um, uh, just quickly, if I may, um, the idea that vocational education is uh, intended for those who can't. Um, and I think what, what's happened is that vocational education has actually become shorthand uh, for those who can't. And we've forgotten that an awful lot of very highly demanding vocational education goes on, but somehow it's not in the voc ed category anymore. I'm talking about medicine and you know, lawyers, teachers, um, etc. So I think it's become a, a shorthand for the sort of not very good bit um, that we might want to um, address. I also just thought that the, um, the place base, the geographical distribution of employment opportunities is really important. Big fan of um, apprenticeships and the apprenticeship levy, which I think could be transformational. <clears throat> you know, large employers who are forking out millions to the levy are going to find a way of getting that back and getting some value out of it. Where you've got... Um, geographical areas where there aren't large employers, uh, you've got small and medium-sized enterprises who are not paying the levy um, and who at best might be able to offer you know, not particularly rewarding apprenticeship um, training because they, they don't have quite the same incentives. So I think you're right to point that up as a real issue. Alison. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on the, the place point as well. Um, you know, the, the, um, geographically, the economy is you know, very unbalanced and, and very unevenly distributed. And I think I tried to sort of argue in my int introductory remarks that it's the lifeblood, really, of good vocational education and apprenticeships to have you know, good employment uh, prospects. So if we haven't got them, that's going to you know, materially affect, affect that. So that's you know, a much bigger political and societal challenge than uh, perhaps just the way we've been talking about it today. There's a real imperative, I think, to address the real social cohesion reasons as well as economic reasons, the um, distribution of work and the quality of work across the economy. It's, uh, it's really shocking at the moment. It's being sucked increasingly into the southeast. A lot of the, the levy is going to be paid in the southeast because that's where the employers are that have you know, got that kind of turnover. And potentially that's going to suck still more from uh, the areas of the country that really do need uh, much more opportunity. Very briefly on the geography question, I live in Norfolk, which has the double whammy of coastal and rural deprivation and does not benefit from the high aspirations of an immigrant community. So it's, it's like a flat line in a hospital, you know, all hands to the pumps, people run from all parts to resuscitate. I totally get the issue about employment prospects, but it, that... What is interesting is it throws into sharp relief quite what one means by vocational. I still think there is a place in a, in a county like Norfolk for strong vocational education in the broad sense that it is engaging a range of skills and attitudes rather than in the more specific pursuit of a job route. But, I, but Alison's already picked up, so I won't repeat it, but there are clear issues to do with social cohesion that can and must be addressed. The other point I just quickly wanted to make is uh, I do like the idea of a vocational approach or a packaged vocational approach to literacy and numeracy. They're the two great... It's come up again and again in one shape or form, but literacy and numeracy are the bedrock of everything we do, and we must be inventive and more creative in the way that we find courses that engage all our <coughs> young people. Thank you. And last word always to Michael. No, no. no. Um, look, I started off by saying this has been ignored for far too long, and we need to address all these issues now since the government seems to be interested in industrial strategy uh, at, at long last. But unless there is real political focus, we're not going to get very far. We're talking about the north and those parts of the country like Norfolk, which, which have languished for far too long. 
Well, that can only be resolved through political uh, intervention. Um, why, for example, if, we, if we're saying that secondary education in places like Liverpool and Manchester and all those satellite towns around those big cities are, is, is extremely poor and getting worse, what is the government doing about it? For example, why are some of the most successful London multi-academy trusts, the Arcs and the Harrises of this world, why aren't they being um, forced, compelled by government to go to these places. You know, it's, it's, very, it's, easy, it's easy for the chief executives of the trust to say, well, we're only interested in London and the South. But they're getting government money, and the government should incentivize them to go to those parts of the country which are languishing. So that's what I mean by political will to make a difference. Well, that's a nice controversial issue to end on. Um, so I think that's been enormously stimulating. Thank you so much for your great questions. And please do join me in thanking again our speakers this evening. Thank you.